My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I greet you all on this most happy day of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we go to church to hear God's message, there are some familiar passages chosen, which we hear every Christmas. But still, there are something new we learn each time. And today we will look up at one familiar text in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, and we will see what new thing God is going to teach us today from it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 from King James Version. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of peace. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Well particularly we look up at verse 6. It says the first clause. For unto us a child is born Unto us a son is given. We will focus on just those words today. First it says a child is born. Then it says a son is given. Well, first of all, a child is born. Last message we saw about the significance of the birth of our Lord Jesus. The significance of the virgin birth particularly. How special it was. Right from his birth, Jesus was totally unique. He was so special. He was not born as we are all born. Only Jesus was born differently. And he was born to a virgin. And he was born and called to be the son of God. Well, that is what we read in the next class. A son is given to us, he says. So, a son is given means... There must be a giver. And who is the giver? Well, brothers and sisters, we all know in James chapter 1, verse 17, it says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. We'll read that in James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights and with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we read, every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Well, brothers and sisters, that is how we got Jesus. A son was given to us by the Father of lights. It came from heaven, from God, Jehovah. Well, Brothers and sisters, Christmas time is a time of giving. We give and we receive. And there is no other time so many presents are given. So many gifts are exchanged. Within the family, among friends, gifts are exchanged or given. Well, the giver of every good gift and perfect gift is God, it says. It is not Santa Claus who gives gifts to us. That is a lie. That is a joke actually. There is no Santa Claus who gives gifts to anybody. It is God Almighty who is the one who gives good and perfect gifts. The gift of life. The gift of all the things in the world. Whatever it may be. If it is good then it is from the father of lights. Well, who is the father of lights? He is the almighty God. The one who created all the stars. The sun, the moon. Well, to give light to us. He is the one who said, let there be light and there was light on earth. He is called the father of lights. He is the creator of the sun. He is the creator of millions and millions of galaxies. Well, he is the one who gives us all good gifts and it is that same giver who gave us 
his son. Well, Jesus Christ is the son of God who was in heaven, who was sent from heaven to be born as a human being to save us. So he is the gift of God, the greatest gift any man can receive in this world is to receive Jesus. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, we spoke about uh, the giver. Now, to whom was this gift given? Well, in this passage in Isaiah, twice we read that he was given to us. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. See, unto us it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Well, brothers and sisters, who does it refer to? Does it refer to Isaiah or the people of Israel where Isaiah was a prophet? Well, yes. But then those people did not see this happen in, the, in their days because this was a prophecy which was to be fulfilled nearly 700 years after it was given. Though Isaiah said it and it was written down, it was not until 700 years before this was fulfilled. So what about the people who lived them? They did not receive this. But still, this prophecy holds good for them also. Well, today we will see to whom was this gift given? Is it only to the people of Israel? Is it only to the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of Judah? Or is it only for Christians? When we read this passage, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, we all Christians say it is unto us, as believers. So he was given unto us. He was sent to us. So we believe that this passage refers to us, believers, Christians. Well, it does. It definitely refers to us because we believe in the son that was given, in the child that was born, and we love him and we accept him. So he belongs to us. So this passage definitely refers to us, Christians. But then, brothers and sisters, in the same passage, if you should look up, it clearly shows us that it is way beyond just Christians. That Christ was given not just only for believers, not only for the people of Israel among whom Isaiah lived, but we will see to whom this gift was actually given. To whom was this child born and for whom was this son given? Well, if you look at from the verse 1 and we see about Galilee of nations mentioned there where Jesus uh, preached and did most of his ministry. And then in verse 2, it clearly points out to whom this gift was given. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. It's talking about a people who walked in darkness. They that dwell in the land of shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Well, the father of lights has sent the true light into this world. Jesus, we know, is called the true light. He's the light of the world. To whom was he given? It says, the people that walked in darkness have seen great light. The people who walked in darkness. And next it says, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. They are the ones upon whom this light has shined, it says. So, when we say those who lived in the land of the shadow of death and people who walked in darkness, it not only refers to Christians or the Jews. Brothers and sisters, it refers to the whole mankind who are walking in darkness, who are living 
in the land of the shadow of death. Well, we know ever since uh, our first parents disobeyed God, when they gave ear to the devil, they deliberately and willingly sinned against their creator. We know that they st stepped into darkness. They went away from God and they went away from the father of lights. Because God is light, we read. And those that want to have fellowship with him must also walk in light. But when Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed, they're walking away from the light and they're walking into darkness. That is what we read in 1 John. Chapter 1, verses 3 onwards, I'll read. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son Jesus Christ. So that is what we have fellowship with Father and His Son Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This is the message we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. So God is light and Jesus Christ his son is light and there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if we say we have fellowship with him and if we are walking in darkness, then we are lying. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So very clearly, when Adam and Eve sinned, they started walking in darkness, walking away from God, walking away from the light. And ever since, mankind has continued to walk even further and further away from the true light, so much so that the first world, just thousand 656 years after creation became so evil and wicked that God had to destroy the whole world. And even after that, we know the world was being repopulated. The people continued to walk in sin and be separated from the true light. So, when once they were separated from God. They started living in darkness. And not only that, they started dwelling in the land of the shadow of death. So all mankind began to die as a result of the sin of their parents. They began to die. You see. And they also began to sin because they are born of the sinful parents they obtained a sin nature and inevitably they also sin and they also die and that's how the whole mankind all the children of men have become sinful and walking in darkness and living in the land of uh, shadow of death that we see very clearly in romans chapter 5 verse 12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So very clearly it says, Wherefore, by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Both the things. You see, when they sinned, they started walking in darkness, walking in unrighteousness, and then death came upon them. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. They are born under the curse. Because Adam and Eve begat children after they were cursed. So the children automatically came under the curse, and they also obtained the sin nature, and they are born to sin, and they also sin, and they also die. So here, Isaiah is speaking about 
the whole mankind because the whole mankind went into darkness and are living in the land of the shadow of death and unto them jesus was sent well brothers and sisters when we say darkness it not only refers to sin and transgression but also the curse which sin brings there is so much sorrow in this world because of sin you know the wages of sin is death but death is the last enemy before death comes so many suffering and all because man is walking in darkness the same passage if you see in uh, chapter 8 was 21 and 22 very clearly it describes the state of man after adam and eve sinned and walked away from god how true up to this day that whole mankind is in darkness and what darkness means we very clearly we see here and they shall pass through it hardly bested and hungry they say bested and hungry and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their god and look upward you can imagine how this was fulfilled when adam and eve were driven out of the garden of eden because of their sin just imagine that how they were living in the garden before they transgressed they had all the fruits of the garden to eat as much as they like every fruit good fruit they could eat without any charge without any work happily they could eat of all the fruits of the garden of eden but once they ate the forbidden fruit they were driven out of the garden and into the wilderness of this earth where they had to toil to eat adam was told by the sweat of the brow thou shall eat thy bread so if he wants to eat something he has to till the ground he has to plant the trees he has to toil and suffer in order to survive how different it was and that creates hunger isn't it they never knew what hunger was when they were in the garden of eden but once they came out of it they had to see hunger and need and they had to work for their bread how true it is today also everybody should work in order to eat they have to toil and if they don't toil they remain hungry brothers and sisters this is what happened because of their sin and it says they curse their king and their god and they look upward whenever they suffer all look up to god and they ask god why why i am suffering like this why the reason is very simply because they chose to disobey god their creator and verse 22 and they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness dimness of anguish and they shall be driven to darkness that is the state of the world today brothers and sisters behold trouble and darkness dimness and anguish so much pain and suffering in this world all because they chose to walk away from god and the more the sin increased the more the anguish and the more the suffering and hunger as we speak today so many people are literally hungry everybody is hungry in one way or the other they all are in pain and so much anguish in this world all this because of the sin of mankind well brothers and sisters so jesus was sent into this world this dark world to be the true light to save this mankind he was not sent only to the people of israel he was not sent only to 
those who would believe in him afterwards but he was sent to all those who are in darkness all those who are dying that is what very clearly we can understand from the scripture and very clearly the scriptures again and again says that Jesus Christ is the light that lights everyone that is born in this world that we see in John chapter 1 from 1 onwards we all know the familiar text how the word came down in flesh that we are all familiar and as we read from verse 3 onwards all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men so it says Jesus Christ had the life and light in himself so in him was life and the life was the light of men and verse 9 says very clearly that was the true light see Jesus was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into this world so you see here Jesus is the true light in him is life and he is the light of men and it says he is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into this world everyone it says all inclusively now last class we saw how three to four babies are born every second and how many babies are born in one minute in one day in one year as we speak children are being born and this verse says he is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into this world so brothers and sisters that's how jesus was sent to unto everyone and in first john chapter 4 verse 14 we read that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world it very clearly says that the father sent his son jesus not to save only a section of the people of the world who lived in a particular time but he was sent to be the savior of the world not only for people who lived in isaiah's time when this prophecy was said it didn't happen because they all died even before he was born and it is not only for those who happened to hear the gospel and who believed afterwards but he was to be the savior of the world the one who gives light to everyone that is born into this world because otherwise so many would not have any hope just think of this God sent his son to be the light of the world to lighten everyone that is born to save the world but why did he send his son 4,000 years after creation from Adam to Christ is a period of 4,000 years what about them Christ was not born at the, their time so there's possibly they can't believe in him and and does it mean that Christ does not save them are they left out just because they were born before Christ was sent well brothers and sisters they're all our ancestors without them we did not come what about them even after Jesus Christ came into this world we know very clearly that not everyone realized who he was his own people the people of Israel stumbled and failed to believe in they could not accept him only a remnant a few people accepted him and were blessed and even afterwards the gospel began to spread into all the world only slowly little by little few people began to believe in Jesus and of course today there are millions of billions of people who believe in Jesus Christ but that happened gradually so as you go back in time the number of those who believed or who heard the gospel and believed in him 
goes on reducing until it comes to zero at Jesus' birth. And then before that, for 4,000 years, nobody even knew about him. But was Jesus sent only for those people who lived after he was born, only for those who were happened to hear his gospel and be saved, and all the rest lose that blessing? It can't be. If God gives a gift, he will give it to all. Because all are in walk, walking in darkness, because all are dwelling in the land of the shadow of death, all need Jesus. Not only those who lived 4,000 years after Christ, not only those who were fortunate to hear the gospel, but the entire world needs his Savior. And the scripture very clearly says that Jesus Christ was given for everybody to be the Savior of the world. And he was born to die. And he died for everybody. That also very clearly we read in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. You see, Jesus was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death. He became a human being. He became a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death. He was born to die. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Again we read, Jesus died for every man. Every man means everybody. Right from Adam till the last man that will be born. So Jesus Christ died for everyone. Jesus Christ was sent by God to be the saver of the world. He is the true light which lighteth every man that is born in the world. How can this be? Well, the concept is very clearly explained to us in the Gospels. And in one particular verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 to 6. 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. You see, what God our Savior wills, very clearly we read here, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all to be saved, not just those who lived after AD 31. But all God wants to be saved. And then in verse 5 we read, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It says there is one God and there is one mediator between man and God and that man is Christ Jesus. And how did Jesus become the mediator? Verse 6 we read, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be justified in due time. So it again says, Jesus is the mediator. And it says that he gave himself a ransom for all. You see, again it says he gave his life as a ransom price, as a redemption price. For whom? For all. Well, brothers and sisters, how clear the Bible is on this matter. Jesus was sent not just to the Jews or for the Christians. He was sent to be born and to die for all. And when Jesus died, he died for all mankind. Those who lived before his time, those who lived after his time. Now how is this made possible? Very simply, he became the second Adam. Well, we know how sin came from one man and death passed upon all. Well, in that same chapter, in Romans 5, if you read below in all the verses, it says, by one man came resurrection. As by one man we were all condemned, by one man we are justified. As by one man we all die, by one man, we all receive the justification of life. 
because of one man all were condemned because of one man all were justified very clearly brothers and sisters and that one man is jesus christ you see now since one because of one man all were condemned jesus became another man and he lived and he was born as a man and he lived a sinless life and when he was a full man he took the penalty that was upon the adam one man adam and he died on his behalf he didn't have to die because he did never sinned but he still died the horrible death on the cross and because of which adam and all his posterity are now released from the curse they are all forgiven how beautiful this verse is you know forgiven i saw this the way they put it is so beautiful isaiah 9 6 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given so how beautiful this is put for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given for given you see forgiven all are forgiven why because jesus died for all god gave jesus to save all mankind so very clearly brothers and sisters uh, from this very passages we can know that to whom the child was born to whom the son was given but many ask how can this be how can anybody be saved having never believed in jesus having never heard about jesus how can they be saved but the scriptures we read it clearly shows that they should be saved god wants them to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth right now it is we should first come to the knowledge of the truth and then be saved but there it is different god wills that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth because god very clearly knows that not all will be able to live in the times when jesus was born and not all will have the equal opportunity to hear the gospel and be saved at this present time why because god himself has let satan in the world to deceive people ever since this started in the garden of eden when satan deceived adam and eve that same satan is continually deceiving people right till the present time and this satan has blinded the minds of those who believe not that we very clearly read in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 in whom the god of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of christ who is the image of god should shine upon them see very clear it says the god of this world hath blinded the minds of those which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel see again light is mentioned jesus is the gospel jesus is the light you see but satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers that they can't see the light the jewish people themselves they could not see the light why because they stumbled at the passages that are given at the very passage which we have taken now and we are so happy to see it being fulfilled the same passages is a stumbling block for the jews because uh, the same chapter which talks about jesus also talks about other things which were not fulfilled when jesus was born you see like this passage unto us a child is born unto us a son is giving given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father the prince of peace and verse 7 of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of david and upon the kingdom to order it to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever now that never happened and that is what 
made it impossible for the Jews to believe then and even today. The Jews, even today, they ask the qu same question. You say Jesus is the Messiah. Okay. But where is it that he fulfilled these prophecies? It says that the Messiah, after he's born, he should take the government upon his shoulder and he should establish the throne of David and he should rule forever. Where that happened? It never happened. So Jesus is not the true Messiah, they say. They're still waiting for the Messiah to come. Well, brothers and sisters, they fail to understand one thing. And same as the Christians also in general fail to understand that God has a larger plan for the whole world. That Jesus is coming, though it is given as one in all the prophecies. Yet, in God's plan, it was split into two. First he would come as a son, would be born of a virgin, take the form of servant, suffer and die. Then he would be taken up, as we see happened in Jesus' life. He was raised on the third day and 40 days later, he went up to heaven. And then he said he will come back again. I will come again, he said. So that is what we are all waiting for. So again he has to come and then fulfill the rest of the prophecies. This is what the Jews fail to understand. Even the Christians, they fail to understand that Jesus died for the whole world and that the whole world will be saved when he comes again. Because the Old Testament prophecies, it speaks as though the coming of Christ is one event. But in between is this gospel age of 2,000 years. See, so this period is not very clearly defined. And that is the reason for confusion. But in God's plan, there was a particular reason for doing this. Because God, in his sovereign wisdom, he wanted to select a group of people during this intermediate period. So Jesus came and died and rose and went to heaven. And there would be nearly 2,000 years before he would come back. And during this period, God wanted to select a few who would really walk like Jesus, live like Jesus, and die like Jesus. So that is the call for the church. That is what we clearly read, that God intended to do during this gospel age, to select among all those who believe, those who really follow him. And once they are ready, then Jesus will come again, and continue to fulfill the rest of the prophecy. And that very clearly we read in this same scripture. See, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Now when it says the government shall be upon his shoulders, it refers to the body of Christ, which is the church. Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body. So when it says that the government shall be upon his shoulders, now they should be the church. So that's why these 2,000 years, God is selecting the members of the body of Christ, right from shoulders up to the foot. Faithful Christians have been chosen by God. They have been prepared by God. They have been tested by God. So that once that body is finished, Jesus Christ will come and take the government into his hands and establish the throne of David and start ruling in justice forever and ever. Well, brothers and sisters, this is so beautiful. That is what we clearly read in the scriptures. We'll just look at Ephesians chapter 1. And we clearly understand 
how God had planned to call out this church. And then once the church is finished, the body will be finished and then Christ will be glorified and he will start his kingdom. All this is very clearly given to us in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 to 23. So from uh, verse 17 onwards, he's speaking to the church and he says like this, verse 17 onwards, I'll read. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You see, it is God who should give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Only by God's help we can understand who Jesus is. Not everybody can understand, but to few it is given to understand the wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, the whole world is not enlightened, but God chooses some and enlightens them. He opens their eyes to realize and see who Jesus really is. And that is such a privilege and that is given only to the church. That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in saints. You see, there is a wonderful hope in his calling. And the riches of his glory of the inheritance of saints, uh, only a few can understand now. And that has been given to the church. Verse 9, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. It's all speaking about a specific group of people. To us word who believe, the believers, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly praises. So what is this glorious thing? That Christ came, died for all, and he was raised, and he is now seated on the right hand of God. All this, only the church can understand. Far above all principality, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus is exalted above all principalities, and power, and might, and dominion. Above every name. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Jesus is already exalted. But only those whose eyes have been opened, only those who are enlightened can see all this. You see why? And because next verse it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. There you see. God has exalted Jesus above all principalities and powers and made him the head over the church. Verse 22. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. And verse 23. Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all. So, very clearly we read here that Christ is the head of the church and church, which is the body, church is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So church is the fullness of Christ. Jesus is the head. And the fullness of Christ is the body. So only when that body is complete, will Jesus take the government upon his shoulders and then begin to establish his kingdom and rule. And that's how the prophecies concerning the Messiah are split into two parts. One side highlights his humility, his servitude, his suffering and his death. The other side highlights his glory, his power. But if that has to be fulfilled, in the meantime, a church has to be prepared. So that's what is going on, brothers and sisters. Jesus came and died, arose and went to heaven. And before he would come back, his body was being chosen and prepared and prepared, readied. And once that is ready, Jesus will come back and begin to rule in this world. And that's when all the other prophecies will be fulfilled. Well, brothers and sisters, this 
wonderful thing how it will be when Christ returns and takes the garment upon his shoulder is given to us in so many scriptures, so many prophecies. And I want to just point out the prophecy in the book of Daniel, in chapter 2 and chapter 7. In chapter 2, various kingdoms were mentioned. Real kingdoms, they were visible kingdoms. We read about an image in Daniel 2 where these kingdoms are portrayed as different parts of the body of various elements. The head of gold, and then the shoulders and chest of silver and then the belly and thighs of brass and legs were of iron. And when the feet was divided into ten parts, what we see happening? A rock was found to be rolling from the mountains and it fell upon the feet and it began to break the image into pieces and then grind them into powder and the wind blew it off and then the rock began to grow and became a mountain and that is how Christ's kingdom is going to be. Very clearly just as God permitted all these various universal empires finally when that empire is divided into Tentos, as we see the division of the European countries now. That is where Rome was, iron. And it was divided into partial clay and mixture of iron. And that those are the countries of the European Union. During that time, Christ will return and establish his kingdom. That very clearly we read in Daniel 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, see these kings means the last remaining kings of the European world, the Roman Empire. And in the days of these kings shall God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. That is the kingdom of Christ, which we are all waiting for. So Christ's kingdom will be set up in the end. And by that time, the church selection will be over. And when Jesus returns, he will break all these corrupt kingdoms. These kingdoms which did not remove suffering from this world. God will destroy and the kingdom of Christ will start growing and fill the whole world. How beautiful it is pictured to us here. And also in chapter 7. You see, in chapter 2, the four universal empires preceding the kingdom of God are illustrated in the image, various metals of that image, gold, silver, brass and iron. In the seventh chapter, they are portrayed as four fearful beasts that rose from the sea. You may want to look up in the seventh chapter. Four beasts. One was lion and then was this bear and then was this leopard and finally this ten-horned beast. These four kingdoms had their time and we all know from history that the first kingdom was Babylon and then came the Persians and then came the Greeks and then the Rome. So the Roman Empire was finally divided into ten parts which are the ten horns of that beast which we see today the ten powerful countries of Europe. And that is when God did something. Someone else came, the fifth universal empire and that very clearly we see from verse 13 in chapter 7, after showing us the, about the four bees, then finally he talks about this fifth kingdom. And he says, And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. You see, after the four bees had their power, the fifth is 
like the son of man. He's a human being, he's a son. Not like the cruel beast. Like the four worldly empires, they were very cruel and fierce. But here, one like the son of man, a man of love. You see, came with the clouds of heaven. He was brought to the ancient of this. Now who's the ancient of this? Very ancient. Old person. Who is that? That is the heavenly father. He was the son. The one like the son of man is Jesus. And he was brought unto the ancient of the days that is Jehovah. And verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. There you see, the whole universal power is given to this one person, the son of man. You see, very clear, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. You see, all other kingdoms were destroyed, but the fifth universal empire will be given to the Son of God, that is Jesus, by the ancient of days, that is Jehovah. And that will happen when Jesus returns again. Then all the people of all languages under the whole sky will be brought to serve him. Well, brothers and sisters, when Jesus is given this power, we know that the church also is with him. Because this son of man, it includes the head and the body. And the body is the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And that we read in verse 27, in the same chapter. And the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. So it says, the people of the saints of the Most High will receive all the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So there you see, why God is waiting for these 2,000 years, since Jesus came and died for all mankind, till he starts to Save all mankind. Because in this period, God is selecting a class of people who would become the body of Jesus. And together, head and body will start the kingdom. Well, brothers and sisters, all that we know very clearly written in the book of Revelation in chapter 20, 21 and 22. In chapter 20, the first thousand years of Christ's kingdom is given. That Christ will first come and the first thing he will do is bind the devil, put him in the bottomless pit so that he can't deceive the people. You see, all these years, God didn't bind the devil. Why? Because God wanted the church to be faithful under adverse circumstances, under temptation, in spite of all this adversity. He was calling and preparing the church. But then when the time came for the world to be saved, Satan is not at all in the picture. He is removed entirely so that he cannot deceive the nations. And then in the same chapter 21 verse 4 we read that the saints are raised in the first resurrection in glorious bodies so that they become one with the glorious Lord Jesus. And then they will rule on this earth for a thousand years. For one thousand years Christ will rule in the beginning. And during that time all the dead right from Adam, all for whom Christ has given himself a ransom, all for whom he tasted death, all will be brought back. Very clearly the scripture says that there shall be a resurrection of the just and the unjust, those who have done evil and those who have done good. All will come back. Those who have done good are the true faithful followers of Jesus. They will be glorified. But the rest will live in his kingdom and be able to come to the truth. That is what God's will was. He wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth is that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God wants all mankind 
those who lived before Jesus was born, those who lived after Jesus was born, but were ignorant of him, all God wants to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he will create that opportunity when Jesus returns. And with the absence of Satan and with the glorification of the church and Christ on his throne, the whole world will come to light. So even though, though so much darkness covers the entire world, yet when Jesus returns, the whole world will see a new day, the millennial day. Well, brothers and sisters, that is what we see in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 3. We'll read this in conclusion. Isaiah 60. This is yet another <coughs> prophecy about Jesus Christ, which was, was partially fulfilled when he was born and completely when he returns again. Arise, shine, for the light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. How true it is in our day. People are so ignorant of God and his ways. They are so evil and wicked. But the Lord shall rise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. See how beautiful. Though darkness cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Verse 3. And the Gentiles, now it doesn't mean only Christians or Jews or believers, but the Gentiles shall come to the light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. So you see, brothers and sisters, that is when Jesus will arise as the son of righteousness as we read in Malachi. So Jesus Christ was the true light but he was born in a manger, in a obscurity, and he grew up, and not all could believe in him. There were so many who were stumbled, and so many who never even knew who he was. Yet, brothers and sisters, when he returns again, nobody can deny him. He will come like the sun. He will arise like the sun of righteousness. And all will come to the light, brothers and sisters. Even Gentiles, or even those who have died, will be resurrected and come to know who Jesus is and what he has done and how he has become the mediator and how through him their sins have been forgiven and they now have chance to get everlasting life. Now that is what will happen in the thousand years. So brothers and sisters, <coughs> this Christmas we all can't forget easily this year, 2021. 20, it's not only because of the ongoing pandemic we started last year and which continues this year and may continue even in the next year. Because we were all wondering if there will be a Christmas service at all. But by God's grace, there is no lockdown and we are able to gather together. But not only because of that, but because of this bill which has been introduced and which is being brought into reality in the assembly in Karnataka, in our state, in Karnataka, this bill called anti-conversion bill is, try, is being implemented. And this has caused a lot of anxiety for all Christians because this will become a tool by which Christians can be harassed and persecuted. Now the clause is that this is a bill to stop forced conversion. Though this is not true, yet it is claimed that Christianity is growing and because of forced conversion, when the reality is actually the percentage of Christian population is reducing. Yet there are some who want to bring this bill and a lot of debate is going on ever since this one BJP MLA called Gulhati Shekhar, he started speaking out against these conversions because his own mother was <coughs> converted and she refused to believe in idols and, and later on 
this become such a family issue and he brought it to the assembly and and he started raising this issue now since that time <coughs> this present government wants to bring this bill to stop this forced conversion and uh, this has been a very something for all christians but the funny thing is this bill actually is called the karnataka protection of rights to freedom of religion bill now what they are actually doing is they are not protecting the rights to freedom of religion but actually they are trying to forcibly stop that freedom take away that freedom that is what we clearly see now even if anybody wants to convert he need permission from the government he need to declare it and it's a long process even for anybody to go to church or to believe in jesus now the government is making it very difficult so it is the opposite of what this bill actually is supposed to be you see karnataka protection of rights to freedom of religion now the freedom of religion is being taken away because even this mla gulhati shekhar's own mother does not have the freedom to believe what she wants to believe she was forced to reconvert actually and she re- reconverted in spite of the fact that she said she would commit suicide then her, her son wanted to commit suicide see all this is forcing emotionally and physically in every threatening way by bringing this new rules no people people's freedom to believe what they believe, want is being taken away now the real force of conversion is what this government is doing this so called ghar wapsi program in which those who have been converted to christianity are forcibly being reconverted to hinduism that is the real force of conversion that is happening because they are threatened they threaten that their rights and their benefits will be taken away and literally gundaism is happening they threaten and forced back to hinduism that is the real forced conversion that is happening christians are not forcing any forced conversion means to threaten them and to pressurize them to convert no no christians are doing that they are only doing good things helping the poor now even that is now made a crime so brothers and sisters when this is going on very clearly as the debate is going on in assembly and so on we realize that evangelism is going to be hit in the coming days and we know that god has permitted all this just to show us christians that the age of this grace is coming to an end and that the lord's coming is very near to us the harvest work which started so many years ago is now coming to an end that is what very clearly we can see in all this god is permitting all these things to happen so brothers and sisters meanwhile when the debate is going on almost every day in the assembly in the congress and a few opposition or opposing this bill but the majority they are for it and there are so many leaders who have come together and religious leaders and they want to impose this bill i really remember what happened in jesus day when jesus was born herod became fearful you see that's how it is the action of government shows that they are fearing christians no christians are less than 2.5% this country with 97.5 non christians most of whom are hindus now they fear this small percentage of christians and they trying to bring a new laws to stop them and to harass them now that shows how powerful these christians are the power does not come in brutal power but the power is in their goodness the power to do good to help people 
And the power is in the truth which they preach. The truth of the gospel. That Jesus died for all. That all are one in Christianity. Now that is what this government fears. Well brothers and sisters. But whatever they do. One thing very clearly we see that. This is all temporary. Just like when Jesus was born. There was this mighty Caesar. Augustus Caesar and later Tiberius Caesar. Where is he now? And there was this Herod, the governor and Pilate, the Roman governor. Where are they now? They're all gone. And there were these religious leaders like the high priest, the Jewish high priest. And with all his powerful priests together. Where are they now? And there was this young rich people, like one young rich man who came to Jesus, but when Jesus asked him to sell everything and follow him, he went away. He was young and rich. Or like the daughter of Herodias, who danced before Herod and she was so beautiful and her dance was so tempting that Herod said he will give whatever she wants. Where are the young and beautiful people? They are all gone. They are all gone and are in the dust. But where is Jesus? Jesus is still there. Jesus is still known in this world. And he is loved by more than 2.3 billion people in this world. 2.3 billion people still love him and believe in him. And want to live for him. How wonderful is Jesus. All others are gone. The mighty Roman Empire. The Caesars. And the high priests. And all the powerful people. Young and beautiful. All are gone. But Jesus still remains. In the hearts of billions of people. And that is what Jesus is. Brothers and sisters, even now when all these things and oppositions against Christians and Christ is happening, we should remember that all this is temporary. If the mighty Roman Empire vanished, and all those great powerful leaders are all now in the dust, and where is this political parties that are rising against Christians today? Where they will stand? So brothers and sisters, it's all very temporary. And as I was reading the newspaper two days back, I saw something which reminded me of one scripture. You know, the headlines we saw, the Madras High Court judge laughed at one case. There's one case presented in the High Court and the judge saw the case and he laughed, it seems. When I read that passage in the newspaper, I rem immediately remembered Psalms chapter 2. Let me just read that in conclusion. How clearly God loves when all these powerful government leaders are getting together to bring in new laws and, and restrictions and, and all this. Very clearly this is what God does and very clearly we see what God says to such people in Psalms chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The heathen rage so vehemently with so much hatred they speak. On TV interviews or in assembly or in various groups there's so much raging. God says why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel. That is what is happening. The kings means the rulers, the government leaders, the heads of the government are set themselves and take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And who is the anointed one? Jesus. They are assembling here. They are taking counsel one with another. They are all coming together against Jesus and they are saying let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us they want to sever 
all Christians from them. They want to break all unity. They want to take away all the benefits from Christians. And verse 4, when they do this, he says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. That's the only place in the Bible where it says God will laugh. He says, He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then the Lord will bring confusion upon them. That's what it says very clearly, brothers and sisters. Verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in sore displeasure. It says, when it, say, when it says God will laugh at them, it's not laughing happily at a joke or something. He is laughing in, a, in sarcastically. Then he will speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. He will start troubling them. He will vex them. It says, Yet have I set my king upon holy hill Zion. He's saying, I have set my king, my son as a king in Zion. And he says to his son, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. And that is what happened when Jesus was born. You see, God is saying, You are my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. God is saying to his son, You ask me, I will give you all the heathen for then inheritance. Now all the heathens, the Gentiles, non-Christians and non-Jews, God is saying, I will give, a, give them to you the uttermost parts of the earth for their possession. Uttermost parts, parts of the earth means including India and Karnataka, and every state and every village, everything God is saying to Jesus, I will give to you as a possession. And verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So when Jesus returns, he's not going to be born again as a babe. He's going to come as a king of kings with the power and authority. And he will smash these kingdoms of this world. Just like as we saw in the book of Daniel, how the rock fell on the image and began to break them into pieces. Jesus Christ will destroy the present evil governments and kingdoms. And then... He advises, God is advising to the people of the world. Be wise now therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. You see, all those who decide about all these matters which relate to the anointed one of God, that is Jesus. God is saying, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Saying, kiss the son. Or... God will be angry and you shall perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. So even little anger from God will destroy all of you. So God is advising them to honor the son, love the son. Jesus Christ is given to everybody. He is a savior. He is a light which will take away all the darkness. So God is saying you accept him. He will love him. He can only love you. He has come to save you and therefore you accept him. And then he says, Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So, brothers and sisters, if we are able to see who Jesus is, if our eyes have already been opened, we really are blessed. And let us continue to put our trust in him. Because all these present troubles will be over and Lord Jesus will come. Destroy all these wicked worldly governments and set up his righteous kingdom on earth and when he does that there will be no bill or no government that can prevent all the people from coming to the true light and we know that very clearly the scripture says that every knee shall bend that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and that day is fast approaching so with this hope let us celebrate this Christmas in Great joy and hope. God bless you.